Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm really happy to be here with David Crew, who's here for our maybe second time, right? Is that is that true, David? Third. Oh my gosh. As you can tell, he's one of my favorites. And um, last time his talk on the Big Dig was just, no, Route 128 was so amazing that I was just like, I have to have him back every time I can get him back. And so here we are today talking about Law and Order Boston style. Um, well, he'll have much more to say about that than I will, but I wanted to say a quick thank you to the Ashland, uh, the Friends of the Ashland Library who support all of our programming. And I wanted to let you know that we will be taking questions at the end of David's talk. And so feel free to put them in the Q&A at any point during the talk, and I will moderate them um, when David's done with his presentation. Um, any chat you have, feel free to put it in the chat. I will be paying attention to that as well. Um, things about like where you're coming from, how awesome this is, any of that. It's all good. So welcome, David. I'm so happy you're here. Um, I could tell people all about you, but I think I'd rather turn it over to you so they can hear from your 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 mouth. <laughs> well, so glad you're here. Thank you, Mina. And thanks, everybody, for joining us on this uh, turning out to be a pretty nice Friday afternoon. I'm so glad that uh, you could join me today. And uh, thank you, Mina. And thank you to the Ashland Public Library for having me. I'm going to stop my video because I want you all to be focusing on the pictures I'm going to be showing. Because at some point in this presentation, I will be talking about the concept of being criminally insane. I'm very interested in this because I believe I must be crazy because I'm not a lawyer, but I'll be presenting the show, which is all about three high profile criminal cases in Boston that I call <laughs> Law and Order Boston. Three different centuries, three murder cases, all of them groundbreaking and some of them still shrouded in controversy. And those three cases are the Boston Massacre, the Dr. Parkman murder, and the Boston Strangler. So we start off, uh, the very first time I gave this talk was at the John Adams Courthouse. John Adams, the second president of the United States, the man who made a name for himself with the Boston Massacre. So let's start with the event itself, a seminal event, not just in Boston history, but in American history. So the basic facts, we all know that on March 5th, 1770, five men were killed when the British troops opened fire on a crowd milling outside the old state house. So just like Lenny Briscoe and Ed Green, our job will be to ferret out the details of the case so it can be turned over to well, not Sam Waterston, but in this case, John Adams. So let's set the scene. Very, very tense times. The British started imposing taxes on the colonists to pay for the French and Indian War. By the way, why shouldn't they? The Crown was protecting them and supporting them with one of the world's great navies. So in 1767, the British Parliament passed the Townsend Acts which taxed paper, glass, and tea. And the colonists started rebelling because, I mean, who likes paying taxes? So in late 1768, British regulars arrive in Boston to maintain order. And Bostonians responded uh, like a Bruins game. They just started with name calling, spitting, fighting. And by early 1770, things were getting really tense. A merchant announced that he would uh, ignore the townwide boycott against British goods. And so some colonists hung him in effigy outside his shop. On February 22nd, 1770, a loyalist named Ebenezer Richardson attempted to destroy the effigy and a mob drove Richardson to his house from where he fired several shots, one of which killed an 11 year old boy named Christopher Snyder. Six days later, there was this immense funeral parade from the Liberty Tree to the cemetery where the boy was buried. Posters were distributed throughout the town implying that the boy's death must be avenged. And four days after the funeral, a British soldier named Thomas Walker entered John Gray's rope walk in Dock Square. 
He was looking for work, which was a common thing. Army pay was horrible, and soldiers were always looking to make a few extra bucks, or in this case, pounds. So rope maker William Green asked Walker, soldier, you want work? Well, yes, I do, Walker replied. And Green said something classy like, well, then go and clean my outhouse, only he, he didn't say outhouse. Now a fistfight starts, made worse when Walker leaves and comes back with more of his soldiers. So now there's a full-scale brawl going on with fists, clubs, and swords. And the next day, March 3rd, three soldiers return to the rope walk to fight some more, and one gets a fractured skull for his trouble. Now it's early on the evening of March 5th on King's Street. And a young wig maker's apprentice by the name of Garrick sees a British officer named Captain Goldfinch. Garrick turns to one of the other soldiers and says, um, there goes the fellow that will not pay my master for dressing his hair. Now, Goldfinch had, in fact, settled his account and ignored the insult. But in this climate, there was no way the matter was going to be dropped. And Garrick, joined by his friends, continued their verbal assault of Goldfinch. Private White says that Goldfinch, quote, was an officer and a gentleman who always pays his debts. At which point Garrick replies, there are no gentlemen in the 29th Regiment, and that's all they needed. So the private, this fellow White, says to Garrick, let me see your face. So Garrick thrusts out his jaw, at which point White smashes his musket into his face and Garrick falls to the ground, bleeding. Now people start shouting, bloody lobster back, lousy rascal, rascal son of a bitch. And somebody started ringing the town bells, signaling the alarm of fire. There is no fire, someone else yelled. Well, kill him, knock him down. Fire, damn you, you dare not fire. And some people began to throw snowballs and pieces of ice at, at the private white, who loaded his gun as he started to retreat back to the custom house stairs with his back to a locked door. He starts banging on the door and yells, turn out the guard, main guard, turn out. In front of the main guard, the officer of the day, Captain Thomas Preston wondered what to do. See, if he did nothing, <laughs> Private White might be killed by this mob. But he also knew his soldiers were vastly outnumbered by the mob. Moreover, Preston knew that there was a law forbidding the military from firing on civilians without the order of a magistrate. Imagine that. You had to get a court order to fire your gun at a civilian. Meanwhile, 200 people were gathering in Dock Square. The whole town seemed to be on edge. People were yelling fire, even though no buildings were burning that night. Soldiers passed up and down Brattle Street, seen here, carrying clubs, bayonets, and other weapons. Finally, Captain Preston made the decision to rescue Private White. Turn out, damn your bloods. Turn out, he barks at his men. And they meet up with Private White at the Custom House stairs and load their muskets as the crowd, now grown to about three, 400 people, forms a semicircle. They continue throwing chunks of coal, snowballs, oyster shells, and sticks at the soldiers. And Preston shouts at them to disperse. Just then, 47-year-old Crispus Attucks, wielding a club, moved forward and grabbed one of the soldiers' bayonets and knocked him to the ground. The soldier rose, shouting, damn you, fire! And he fires one shot in the direction of the crowd. Now, no one seemed to be hit by that first shot and the crowd pulled away from the troops. And then there was a pause. Some people said it was as little as a few seconds. Others said as much as two minutes. We simply don't know. What we do know is the troops suddenly started firing. Samuel Gray fell with a hole in his head. Crispus Attucks took two bullets in the chest. As some members of the crowd surged forward, another sailor, James Caldwell, was hit. A ricocheting bullet struck 17-year-old Samuel Maverick as he ran toward the townhouse. And Patrick Carr's back was ripped apart by another shot. It was sheer mayhem. Captain Preston yelled at his men, demanding to know why they had fired. And they said 
they heard him yell the word fire. Some in the crowd moved to help those who were hit, and the troops raised their muskets. Preston commanded them to cease fire and went down the line, pushing up their musket barrels. The wounded, the dying, and the dead were carried away. Captain Preston and his men then marched back to the main guard. Word of the shootings reached acting Thomas, uh, Governor Thomas Hutchinson, and he rushed to King Street, where he found an angry crowd and a shaken Captain Preston. Hutchinson confronts Preston. Do you know, sir, you have no power to fire on anybody of the public collected together, except you have a civil magistrate with you to give orders? And after talking with Preston, Hutchinson proceeded upstairs in the townhouse. Reassuring the town council members who were gathered in the custom house that he would do his best to see justice done, he stepped onto the balcony overlooking the scene of the massacre where a crowd was still milling angrily about. Let the law have its course, he said. I will live and die by the law. Shortly thereafter, Justices Richard Dania and John Tudor issued a warrant for the arrest of Captain Preston. He was brought to the townhouse where he was interrogated by the justices and they concluded they had, quote, evidence sufficient to commit him. And they sent Preston to jail where he would remain for the next seven months. The next day, 34-year-old John Adams was asked to defend the soldiers and their captain. Now, that's a pretty brave thing because Adams knew that taking this case would not only subject him to criticism, but it might jeopardize his legal practice or even risk the safety of himself and his family. But Adams believed deeply that every person deserved a defense and he took on the case without hesitation. For his efforts, he would receive the modest sum of 18 guineas. A week after the massacre, the request of the attorney, uh, Jonathan Sewell, a grand jury handed down indictments against Captain Preston and the eight soldiers. About the same time, Preston offered his version of the events of March 5th in a deposition. Now, this is really interesting. And again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. But there are some interesting decisions that had to be made by the court, the prosecution, and by Adams. Number one. Should Captain Preston be tried separately from his men? Some of the eight soldiers under his command wanted to be tried with their captain, and for good reason, because Preston's best defense lay in denying that he gave any orders to fire. And the soldier's best defense lay in claiming that they were following their captain's orders. Again, as a layperson, I find this fascinating for this reason alone is following orders of defense. The decision rendered here would resonate through history at Nuremberg, Milai, Serbia, and even Guantanamo. Another big question was the order of the cases, because if Preston's trial were to go first, the soldier's defense might be compromised. Finally, we have the fact that John Adams had agreed to defend both Preston and his men even though their respected defenses were at odds with one another. My understanding that is today, that would be constituting an ethical dilemma, which would have forced Adams to choose between his clients. Meanwhile, the soldier's uh, request for separate trials uh, was denied. Uh, I'm sorry, was accepted. So Captain Preston's trial for murder came first from October 24th to the 30th at the Queen Street Courthouse. This case was a classic political hot potato, and we don't know what that's like these days, do we? The Chief Justice uh, of the Supreme Superior Court, Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson, declined to preside at the trials. Benjamin Lind of Salem became the acting Chief Justice, and he wanted to resign his position twice before the trials began. Attorney General Sewell refused to prosecute the soldiers. The prosecution was led by Samuel Quincy, the colony's solicitor general, and Robert Treat Payne, who would later become the first attorney general of Massachusetts and a justice of the state Supreme Court. 
Josiah Quincy assisted John Adams in his defense of Preston. The central issue concerned whether or not Preston gave the order to fire on civilians. He steadfastly denied that he did. He was supported by three defense witnesses, but four other witnesses for the prosecution swore that he did. Here's an example. The eyewitness by the name of Daniel Calla testified, quote, I heard one of the guns rattle. I turned about and looked and heard the officer who stood on the right in the line with the soldiers give the word fire twice. I looked at the officer in the face when he gave the word and I saw his mouth. I saw his face plain. The moon shone on it. John Adams eventually succeeded in creating doubts in the minds of jurors as to whether Preston ever gave an order to fire. By the way, we have no transcript of this of this trial. Uh, we only know from the results and general reports in the papers. The sequestered 12-man jury deliberated only a few hours before acquitting Preston on all charges. And then eight weeks later, November 27th, 1770, the eight soldiers would face trial. A transcript of this trial, formerly called Rex v. Weems, survives. Witnesses testified to the clashes with the military at Gray's Rope Walk, as well as the events on the night of March 5th near King Street. On December 5th, 1770, exactly nine months after the massacre, six of the soldiers were acquitted on all charges. Two, a private Montgomery and a private Kilroy, I love that name, they were convicted of manslaughter because it was ruled there was proof that they fired into the crowd. At their sentencing on December 14th, both Montgomery and Kilroy pled, quote, the benefit of clergy to reduce their punishment to branding. The court accepted their plea and their right thumbs were branded before the two men were sent back to England. Later that month, Captain Preston sailed for England, but not before receiving 200 pounds in compensation for his troubles relating to the Boston Massacre. How the five victims of the massacre were viewed depended on where you stood, of course. Loyalists saw them as thugs and ruffians, but patriots made them into martyrs for the cause of American independence, not just here in Boston, but throughout the British colonies. And the case catapulted John Adams into the public eye, and he would later serve as our second president. Of the three cases we have tonight, only this one has a single victim. But of all our victims in our three cases, only Dr. George Parkman was prominent before his death. Oliver Wendell Holmes once called George Parkman, quote, the perfect Yankee. He said that Parkman, quote, abstained while others indulged, walked while others rode, worked while others slept. Parkman grew up the son of a successful businessman who owned property in the West End. But when he grew up, instead of taking up the family business, he studied medicine and graduated from Harvard Medical College in 1813, then traveled to Europe, where he became interested in the plight of the insane. And here's a really cool fact about Parkman. He returned to America from Europe in 1813 aboard the USS Constitution. Back in Boston with the War of 1812 still raging, Parkman enlisted and received a commission as a surgeon in the Massachusetts militia. At the same time, he was also acting as physician to the poor. Now, his experience in Europe taught Parkman that psychiatric institutions should reflect a residence-like setting where patients could enjoy hobbies and socializing and participating with household chores. In 1817, he convinced the trustees of the Massachusetts General Hospital that he should supervise an asylum that they were considering opening. And that same year, he offered to raise $16,000 for construction. That's a lot of money back then. Now, giving all that money, Parkman thought he was a cinch to be named the head of what would be called McLean's Hospital. But the trustees gave the position to someone else because they were concerned how it would look if Parkman was given an appointment 
that he had endowed. Parkman apparently took a hissy fit. While he didn't give up medicine, he shifted his focus to the family business. And he, again, was a really hard worker. And by 1849, he was worth some half a million dollars. This is John White Webster. He was born in Boston in 1793 and was, like Parkman, another rich and well-connected Bostonian. He also studied at Harvard Medical College, and he practiced in the Azores before returning to America, and in 1824 began working for Harvard, eventually becoming a professor in 1827. But it seems that Webster was always having money problems. He lost the mansion he had built in Cambridge due to mounting debt, and he had been borrowing money from many people, including his friend, George Parkman from whom he first borrowed $400 back in 1842. Now, five years later, he still hadn't repaid the loan. So he gives Parkman a promissory note for $2,432, not only to cover the unpaid balance, but to get even more money. For collateral, Webster used in part a cabinet of rare minerals that he owned. A year later in 1848, he borrows another $1,200 from a fellow named Robert Gould Shaw. Yeah, the father of that Robert Gould Shaw. Now, here's the thing. The collateral he used was the mineral collection he had already used for the Parkman loan. Parkman hears about this, was furious, and he begins to hound Webster for his money. On November 23rd, 1849, just about a week before Thanksgiving, George Parkman left his Beacon Hill mansion to do some errands. He was last seen walking toward Harvard Medical College to meet Dr. Webster. And then George Parkman disappeared off the face of the earth. Now, a prominent man like Parkman doesn't just disappear. People notice and they notice quickly. Within two days, the family had 28,000 copies of this $3,000 reward notice posted, uh, printed up, posted, and distributed all over the city. And rumors are just flying through Boston. An Irish immigrant had done the deed, or, or, or maybe one of Parkman's deadbeat tenants, or maybe it was a robbery gone awry. You know, there were over 100 newspapers in the city, the great famous Penny Press, and the story was helping to sell a lot of papers. Okay, Briscoe and Green, time for you guys to get to work. So the police retraced Parkman's last day. One woman who owed Parkman money, <laughs> I love this, remembered how she had to run away from him when he demanded the dollar he had seen in her hand as she tried to pay for food. Another man recalled that Parkman had placed a grocery order for Thanksgiving that would, was to be sent to his house. Others remembered him, wishing them a happy Thanksgiving as he walked his way to the Harvard Medical College. Um, the police interview a man who said Parkman left some lettuce with him, saying he would return for it as soon as he could so he could have lunch with his wife at 2 p.m. that day, something he had done each and every day of their 33-year marriage. I can, you know, I can just hear Lenny Briscoe saying, you know, that Parkman was a pretty busy guy. Oh, and the police learned something else, that Dr. John Webster had visited Parkman's home earlier in the day, suggesting that they meet at the medical college that afternoon. They also learned that at 1.45 p.m., someone saw Parkman enter the school, and now Dr. Webster is on the cop's radar. They ask around, and they find that Webster was home by 6 p.m. and had gone to a party at a friend's house. He appeared calm, but suspicions were raised. And on November 27th, the police search Webster's rooms at the laboratory. They find nothing. This is Ephraim Littlefield, the janitor at the medical college. He was uh, what they used to call a swamp Yankee. A swamp Yankee is basically a New England version of a redneck. Anyway, 
Mr. Littlefield was also under suspicion as he had access to Webster's lab. But Littlefield, he had suspicions of his own. Five days after Parkman disappeared, Littlefield watched Webster from under the laboratory door, moving from the furnace to the fuel closet and back eight times. Yeah, he counted. Later in the day, the furnace was burning so hot that the wall on the other side was hot to the touch. So on November 29th, Littlefield began chiseling away at the wall under Webster's private lab privy, where police had not searched. The next day he broke through and there, on top of a mound of dirt, he saw a human pelvis, a dismembered thigh, and the lower part of a leg. Now, bones in the vault would be expected. It is, after all, where remains from human dissections were tossed. But the city coroner came in and he identified those as Dr. Parkman's. Police then went to Webster's home and took him to jail on a charge of murder. When they told him what Littlefield had found, Webster exclaimed, quote, that villain, I am a ruined man. And later that night, he took strychnine. Now, I find it strange that a doctor didn't know what the lethal dosage of strychnine was because the stuff only made him ill. On December 1st, back at the lab, investigators traced a terrible foul smell to a tea chest, which they opened and out tumbled an armless, headless, and partly burned male torso, whose head had been sewn off, sawed off. Then they found the saw. They brought Mrs. Parkman in, and she identified the body as her husband's. I'm not going to speculate what it was about that torso, but we move on. The coroner had already estimated the man's height to be five foot ten, which was an exact match to George Parkman. The evidence against Webster seemed overwhelming. But you know, the Brahmins of Boston, they stuck together. They were loath to believe that one of their own had done this horrible deed. Longfellow's second wife, the former Frances Appleton wrote, quote, of course we cannot believe Dr. Webster guilty, bad as the evidence looks. Many suspect the janitor, who is known to be a bad man, and to have wished for the reward offered for Dr. Parkman's body. Uh, and Harvard librarian John Langdon Sibley wrote in his journal, quote, the professors who at the mere suspicion he is guilty. Nevertheless, on January 26, 1850, a grand jury returned a true bill that indicted Webster for the murder of George Parkman. Despite some Brahmin reluctance to believe his guilt, both Daniel Webster and Rufus Choate declined to serve as counsel. <laughs> They're jumping off the ship, folks. Harvard graduate Edward D. Sawyer, who had handled Webster's financial matters, but was completely inexperienced in criminal law, was the default, and he became Webster's lead counsel. A fatal decision by John Webster. Some have called the Parkman murder the O.J. Simpson trial of the 19th century. One researcher summed it up by saying, quote, it had everything a good murder story needs, a, a rich, well-known victim, a well-respected suspect, gruesome evidence, and a possible underdog hero. And like the O.J. Simpson trial, the public was consumed with every detail. Over 60,000 people would see at least a part of the trial as did reporters as from far away as London, Paris, and Berlin. On the first day of the trial, Dr. Webster pleaded not guilty. An hour later, a panel of 12 men uh, began to sit in the box. The trial began on March 19th with Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court presiding. Leading the prosecution, was the Massachusetts Attorney General, John Clifford. He, by the way, would later serve as governor of the state. Anyway, the trial proceeds. The jury visited the scene of the crime, even entering the privy pit. Back at the courtroom, the prosecution had the coroner explain what was needed to burn a corpse and the odor it would produce. Then 
had an anatomy professor explain how his department's dissection specimens would differ from the body found in the privy. The defense tried to create doubt that the body was Parkman's and questioned whether the wound they saw on his body had killed him as there was so little blood near it. On the third day, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who was the dean of the Harvard Medical College, testified his belief that the body had been dismembered by someone with a knowledge of dissection and anatomy, that a wound between the ribs as seen on that body would not necessarily cause a large amount of blood, and that the corpse's build was, quote, not dissimilar to that of George Parkman. Dr. Jeffries Wyman took the stand and he showed how the bones in the privy all fit together. By the way, can you imagine sitting in a trial and seeing somebody actually piece together pieces of a body? Anyway, this is Dr. Nathan Keep. He was Dr. Parkman's dentist. And he, by the way, is further proof to my theory that all roads lead to Scully Square, as he was a partner with Dr. William Thomas Morton, the dentist whose practice in Scully Square first used uh, ether in the practice of dentistry. Anyway, on the stand, Keep burst into tears as he showed how the loose teeth from the furnace fit into the plates that he had made for Dr. Parkman. He composed himself and he showed through an inscription that the mold had been made specifically, which in which the teeth fit, had specifically been made for Parkman. And ladies and gentlemen, this was the first time ever that dental evidence was used in a murder trial. But it was Ephraim Littlefield whose testimony would be the most damning. Littlefield told how Parkman had been after Webster to pay back his loan, how Webster had asked him if one could use a light inside the dissecting room vault, how Webster began locking his rooms. Um, he was also told about, he also told about the heat of the walls that had led him to dig into the privy. The defense cross-examined and accused Littlefield of being after the reward, which he denied, of course. What they didn't do was actually turn around and accuse him of murder, which would have been a nice deflection. The prosecution wrapped up their case by presenting more witnesses who testified about Webster's unusual behavior after Parkman's disappearance. They also showed three unsigned letters that would been obviously been uh, created to throw the police off the track of their investigation. And the handwriting was identified as Webster's. The defense took over and Edward Sawyer, the financial man, went into action. He argued that the prosecution had failed to show beyond a reasonable doubt that Webster was the killer, or even how Parkman had died. He claimed that Webster had repaid the debt. He then brought in 23 character witnesses and seven others who claimed to have seen Parkman after his supposed disappearance. But the judge instructed the jury to ignore their testimony. He ruled those sightings were actually of a Springfield man and a Parkman lookalike named George Bliss, who the prosecution said, without testimony from Bliss or anyone else, was in Boston on the day of Parkman's disappearance. Um, as the trial ground to a close, Webster himself then took the stand against his attorney's strong advice. And in the 15 minute speech, he criticized his own attorneys and presented his own version of the evidence, after which he called on the author of those three letters to reveal themselves. Of course, none did so. The defense then gave a six hour speech on four key points that the prosecution had to prove. That the body was Parkman's, two, that a homicide had occurred, three, that Webster had perpetrated it, and four, he had done so with malice aforethought. The defense contended that Parkman had been seen leaving the college on Friday afternoon, and the prosecution's taste case was in tatters, most importantly, because there was no corpus delecti. 
nobody that was whole that could conclusively be shown to be Parkman's. And that, if you're a lawyer, you know that was the main challenge faced by the prosecution. Because even though their circumstantial evidence was overwhelming, they still had the problem of the corpus delecti rule. Nobody. But Judge Shaw, in his instructions to the jury, made a precedent-setting ruling. He said that the jury only needed to find beyond a reasonable doubt that the corpus delecti, the body, was actually Parkman's. See, at the time, the standard in murder cases was proof to an absolute certainty that the body was that of the victim. But Shaw said, in part, quote, it sometimes happens, however, that it cannot be found, where the proof of death is clear. Sometimes in the case of a murder at sea, the body is thrown overboard on a stormy night. Because the body is not found, can anyone deny that the author of that crime is a murderer? In that same speech, Judge Shaw also identified, uh, defined alibi, circumstantial evidence, and reasonable doubt. Now, at the time, this is 1850, many people thought he was being far too argumentative for a judge. But his words, called the Webster charge, are still quoted in courtrooms today. Well, it took the jury less than three hours to convict Dr. Webster, and Judge Shaw passed sentence, death by hanging. Webster's lawyers fought to save their client's life. They submitted a petition for a writ of error against Judge Shaw and those instructions to the jury. But since the hearing was held in front of Ju uh, Shaw and four of the judges, it should come as no surprise that the writ was denied. Webster then appealed to the governor for a pardon, but unfortunately for Webster, just the year before, before, a young man named Washington Good, a black sailor, had been hanged for the murder of a fellow sailor based on circumstantial evidence. And to pardon Webster after sending Good to the gallows would have undermined the governor's reputation. It was then that Webster confessed to the murder claiming they had lost control in an act of passion. Ironically, that confession supported a defense of temporary insanity, which, if used at the trial, might have saved his neck. Instead, he was hung by it on August 30th, 1850. Temporary insanity. It would play a huge role in the last of our three cases. It may have been only over 40, wow, 50 years ago now, but these three words can still strike fear into people who lived through the reign of terror that was the Boston Strangler. It happened actually as two waves of terror. The first began on June 14th, 1962, with the sexual molestation and murder of 55-year-old Anna Slezers in her apartment here on Gainsborough Street. Just two weeks later, an 85-year-old woman was found dead of a heart attack, apparently after somebody tried to strangle her. Then four more sexual assault murders, all of women above the age of 65. Panic quickly grew as newspapers, radio, and television began to focus on the string of apparently connected murders. Without any sign of forced entry into their buildings, almost all the women were assumed to have either known their assailant or have voluntarily allowed him into their homes, perhaps believing him to be an apartment maintenance person or some other service person. While the police were not convinced that all of these murders were the work of a single person, much of the public was led to believe so. A fifth murder would occur on August 30th, 1962. And then the murder stopped. September, October, November, nothing. And slowly, the tension and paranoia that had begun to grip the city abated. Then on December, 20-year-old Sophie Clark was found strangled and sexually assaulted. A few weeks later, the same fate befell a 23-year-old woman, and panic returns. 
then a three-month lull before March 1963, when a 69-year-old woman named Mary Brown is found stabbed and beaten to death. In May, another woman, a 23-year-old this time, she's found stabbed to death. Then another brief respite over the summer before a 58-year-old is found strangled in September. Two and a half months later, another strangle murder, this time of a 23-year-old. One writer described it as if Jack the Ripper had returned not to London, but to Boston in the 1960s. The reward for information leading to the capture of the strangler rose with the ensuing panic until it reached over $100,000. Police were so desperate that in January 1964, they brought in a Dutch psychic by the name of Peter Herkus to help them find the strangler. But they probably would have had better luck with Dionne Warwick and her friends. Seems by 1964, everybody had an opinion and they wanted to share about the case. Psychiatrist James Bressel weighed in, saying that he believed that the strangler was an unmarried, paranoid schizophrenic. He got his picture in the paper, but the police didn't have any better leads. Other so-called professionals theorized he was a homosexual, not explaining why a homosexual would be raping women. The last victim attributed to the strangler was the 11th, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan. She was found dead on January 4th, 1964. Her body, like so many others, was left naked with a nylon stocking around her neck. The murderer also placed a New Year's card between two of her toes. And then the murder stopped again. Now, during the time the Boston Strangler was actively murdering women in the Boston area, another crime spree was underway that didn't get much media attention, but was being followed by the police. All over Southern New England, the Green Man, who got his nickname because he always wore dark green work pants, was apparently raping in the hundreds women after slipping into their apartments and tying them up. On October 27, a young woman was attacked in her home by a man who gained entrance by pretending to be a detective. He pinned her down on the bed and threatened her with a knife. Not a sound or I'll kill you, he said. After tying her hand and foot and molesting her, he inexplicably made off, simply saying, I'm sorry. When she freed herself, the woman called police who linked the green man to Albert DeSalvo, a convicted sex offender who had four years earlier served a year in jail for rape. Police arrested the 33-year-old married man who had two children. DeSalvo, there's just no nice way to say this. He had a horrible childhood. His father was a violent, wife-beating alcoholic who would bring prostitutes home and force the children to watch his sexual activities. Albert and his sisters were forced to steal to survive. Their fathers taught them shoplifting, robbery, as well as breaking and entering. At the age of 10, Albert would prostitute himself to homosexuals in the area. And at 12, he was sent to a reformatory. So in 1948, he joined the army. And in fact, he seemed to start to straighten out. He won the, universe, the US Army Middleweight Boxing Championship, married a nice German girl whom he brought back to the United States. But when posted at Fort Dix, he was charged with a sex offense that involved the molestation of a nine-year-old girl. Now the charges were dropped when the parents refused to proceed with the case and Albert was then later honorably discharged. So the police, seeing his record, had DeSalvo sent to the hospital at Bridgewater State for observation, where he became something of a braggart to the other patients, apparently boasting about his sexual exploits. Then he allegedly confessed to his cellmate, this man, a murder suspect by the name of George Nasser. With a reward sitting out there for information leading to the strangler's arrest, Nasser contacted his lawyer about the confession that DeSalvo had made, and he convinced his lawyer to meet with Albert DeSalvo. 
You've all probably heard that lawyer's name. It was F. Lee Bailey. So Bailey meets with DeSalvo, who admits to the lawyer that he was the strangler, confessing not only to the 11 murders police had attributed to him, but to two others as well. DeSalvo provided many chilling details of their deaths. Bailey contacts police, who had a problem. While DeSalvo's detailed descriptions of the case were almost flawless, they had no physical evidence to convict him. So they decide to have the Assistant Attorney General, John Bottomley, interrogate DeSalvo. Bottomley reported that DeSalvo possessed details about the murders that were not available by reading the newspapers. And now a legal battle begins that would make F. Lee Bailey a star. Because if Bottomley determines that DeSalvo was telling the truth, that he was the strangler, then Bailey would ask psychiatrists to rule on whether DeSalvo was insane. If they said he was insane, then DeSalvo would make a formal declaration of his guilt. However, if they said that he was sane, then there would be no confession, at which point proceedings against DeSalvo would stop because there was no other evidence against him. But the psychiatrist ruled that DeSalvo was insane, yet the prosecutors refused to accept that the confession could be made under the protection of that insanity. So if convicted of even one strangler murder, Albert DeSalvo would die. So Bailey comes up with a brilliant maneuver to keep his client from the electric chair. DeSalvo would not stand trial for the strangler murders. Remember, there's no evidence other than his confession, but he would stand trial for the Green Man case, which meant that Bailey could bring in psychiatrists to testify to DeSalvo's insanity, thereby allowing him to be declared legally insane Whatever the prosecutors say, once that, uh, that um, ruling is made, DeSalvo is legally insane, therefore not guilty by that insanity for any of the crimes committed, including the Strangler murders. In 1967, Albert DeSalvo went on trial for the Green Man case, pleading insanity, but he's found guilty and sent back to Bridgewater Hospital, where Five weeks later, he and two other inmates escape. The police launch a massive manhunt. The two other men are quickly found. Two days later, DeSalvo himself gives up and is taken back into police custody. The police even allow him to give a brief news conference in which DeSalvo says, quote, I didn't bother anybody, unquote. And he says that he escaped essentially to bring attention to the fact that he had a mental illness and yet was being treated as a sane criminal. He may add a point. In any case, DeSalvo was transferred to the maximum security prison in Walpole, where he remained until November 25th, 1973. And that's when he was stabbed to death in his cell. Nobody confessed. Nobody snitched and the murderer of Albert DeSalvo got away. Now, Nancy Grace or Greta Van Susteren or any of those TV lawyers, they'd have had a field day with the Strangler case. Lord knows producers sure have with a TV special of three movies about the case. In fact, there's actually a, a new one about to come out uh, starring Carrie Coon from The Gilded Age. Uh, the most well-known movie up to now is the 1968 film starring Tony Curtis and Henry Fonda, which did a pretty good job of doing what the courts didn't, which is convict Albert DeSalvo of the Strangler murders. Many people question whether DeSalvo was indeed the Boston Strangler. Susan Kelly, author of this book, The Boston Search for the Strangler, believes DeSalvo fabricated the entire story. She concedes that his confession was accurate on many details, but adds, quote, the newspapers were an excellent source of information. And it's very interesting to see that, um, very, to, to me, that the details that Albert got wrong in his confession were identical to the details that the newspapers got wrong. By the way, that's obviously not Susan Kelly's book. That is, this is a different uh, 
uh, book. Kelly thinks that several different perpetrators committed the crimes. Robert Ressler is a criminologist and former profiler for the FBI. In fact, he's the guy who coined the term serial killer. Among the many cases he worked on was the Jeffrey Dahmer case. He believed that it was unlikely that one person was responsible for all the Strangler murders. Quote, you're putting together so many different patterns here that it's inconceivable behaviorally that all these could fit one individual. In the year 2000, attorney Elaine Whitfield Sharp took up the cause of the DeSalvo family and of the family of Mary Sullivan, who had been identified as the Strangler's final victim. She organized the exhumations of both Sullivan and DeSalvo, which supposedly revealed that DNA evidence found on Sullivan did not match DeSalvo. Remember, because they had no DNA uh, analysis back in 64. Uh, James Starrs, professor of forensic science at George Washington University, told the news conference that DNA evidence they found could not associate DeSalvo with the murder. That DNA and other forensic evidence were used to make the case that DeSalvo was not her killer by Casey Sherman, who also was Mary Sullivan's nephew, in his book, A Rose from Mary. For example, DeSalvo confessed to raping Sullivan, yet the forensic investigation performed in 1964, before precise methods of testing and before DNA analysis were developed, revealed no evidence of sexual activity. There are also suggestions from DeSalvo himself that he was covering up for another man, the real killer, whom some believe was George Nasser, DeSalvo's cellmate at Bridgewater, to whom DeSalvo supposedly confessed. Of course, the question you're probably asking is, why would DeSalvo admit to the crimes? Um, that the DeSalvo and Sullivan family said back then that he hoped to secure a book and a film deal. So at this point, we should probably change the name of this show from Law and Order Boston to Boston CSI Boston, because remarkably precise tools, not available even in 2000 to Ms. Sharp, have been applied to the case by the state, allowing law enforcement to provide us with some certainty about at least one of the crimes attributed to Albert DeSalvo. In 2013, the remains of DeSalvo were unearthed from his grave here in Peabody by the state. So if you're keeping track, that's the second exhumation. And his DNA was compared to that found at the scene of Mary Sullivan's murder by a reputable, nationally renowned lab. And they matched. Which allowed Attorney General Martha Coakley to say publicly, quote, this leaves no doubt that Albert DeSalvo was responsible for the brutal murder of Mary Sullivan, and most likely that he was responsible for the horrific murders of other women he confessed to killing. Neither the Sherman family or Whitfield Sharp are contesting those results, although Sharp has issues with some of the methods police used to connect DeSalvo's family DNA. So there you have it, folks. Uh, three infamous murders three different centuries, each one uh, the source of controversy even today. I'm going to stop the show. I'm going to turn on my video thing here, and I'm going to thank you again. Hello. Thank you again for joining me. And uh, Mina, let's uh, see what uh, questions we have. Okay. So as I mentioned to people, um, we are taking questions in the Q&A, which is down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Feel free to throw some questions in there as, um, as we just, just continue our conversation. David, that was fascinating. I have to say that I think you're like one of the best storytellers <laughs> I've ever met. Thank you. Um, Very flattering. Thank you. Well, as a librarian, you know, I meet a lot. So I, I know what about I speak. Um, I actually have a question to get us started mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't have to do with these, these particular, what, you know, particular ones, but I'm wondering like, what drew you to these, these particular ones? I mean, some of them are pretty, you know, they're all kind of well-known except maybe the middle one. I didn't know about that one, but like, there's so many crimes that happen, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, throughout history in this area. What, what was compelling for you to pick these three? Well, um, uh, the, the John Adams uh, story, which again, I, 
I see it through the lens of John Adams, uh, having written a book about the presidents uh, and their landmarks with my father, uh, and then coming to Massachusetts, there's the John Adams Courthouse, John Adams being, you know, uh, uh, from this area. So that I naturally gravitated to that and the story of him defending the members, uh, the, the, um, the, the soldiers is, it's, it's, just, it's, it's a great story. Mm -hmm. um, I had heard the name George Parkman and the, about these Beacon, this Beacon Hill uh, murder, these the, the Brahmin against Brahmin violence. And that just, uh, that fascinated me. I ended up uh, researching it and writing an article for History Magazine. Um, and, and so as I, I looked at these two cases and then uh, actually uh, met somebody whose uh, uncle was a detective who was uh, uh, trying to solve the case of the Boston Strangler. So I just said, oh boy, look at that. One in each of these three centuries and this running theme of insanity. And again, you know, if you know me, it's, <laughs> it's a, it kind of resonated with me. So I said, oh, yeah, I just, so I just kind of took the pieces and started building this, this talk. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm also really curious about, um the concept of this law and order concept, which takes it from the crime to the, the through the legal system. So did you find that it was harder to find uh, research, maybe the older, oldest case versus the newer case in the middle one? No, because uh, obviously we, we know a lot about the Boston massacre. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I should also point out, by the way, the, that uh, my co-author on the presidential landmarks book was my father. And he was a huge Law and Order fan. Mm. Um, he was deaf too, so whenever I'd go and visit him in New York, that do not don't sound would like the house would vibrate because he loved watching that show. Um, so it just it just kind of came together. And th th believe me, there is there, are, there are a lot of people preceded me with some terrific research and books and articles, and now of course with the web. You just type in Dr. George Parkman and all of this great stuff just comes up. So just it just that's the way my mind works. I thought, well, that we can sort of tell these three stories that have this common theme running through them. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, so somebody's asked, could you please repeat the three precedents that the judge in the Webster case set in motion? Um, the, the primary one is the 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 corpus delecti rule, which said that it had to be the body had to identify with an absolute certainty, as opposed to what he said would be beyond a reasonable doubt. That mm -hmm. was the that was the primary one. Um, and now you're going to force me to think back to uh, 30 slides ago. Uh, I'd have to go back and actually bring up my own presentation. To, but I'd be happy to do that. Because it's a great question. Well, I'll tell you that Nancy says you have a great voice and delivery for this. Oh, she really? Looks forward <laughs> to more stories. <laughs> oh, well, that's very kind. And my slide software just crashed. So, oh, I no. Don't have... <laughs> well, you know what? You can send it to me and I okay. can um, put it out in my recap email. Okay. Um, and for those people, I know it's um, about an hour and some people are heading out, but um, David will be back with us on June 23rd at 1 p.m. to talk about the, the big dig. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. But we do have another question here. The, um, they should use that one method to, to determine the cause of death of Edgar Allan Poe. What do you think? It's been discussed over the years. I'm not sure which method. I'm not familiar with the case. Um, the death of Edgar Allan Poe, was that a, was he like, eh, eh, no? I, I No, 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 I don't, it wasn't, a, I don't know. <laughs> That's a that's an interesting question because you know, given his profession of writing those gothic novels, so gothic stories, I, I don't know. I'd have you know, and my wife would know because she loves stuff like that. She loves I'll have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, so that's actually the only questions that we have. I think that you're uh, you really covered everything. In, uh... Well, thank you all, and and thank you everybody again uh, for attending, and thank you Mina for having me, and I'll. Hopefully see you all again in June. Definitely. I would look Thank forward to Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a great day.